AI is a powerful tool. This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading, action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the AI for Good Discovery Series on AI for Biodiversity. Uh, this series represents a partnership between the International Telecommunications Union, the Convention on Biological Diversity, NatureServe, and Columbia's Alexander von Humboldt Institute. And my name is Mike Gill, and I'm the director of the Biodiversity Indicators Program at an organization called NatureServe. And NatureServe is a science-based conservation organization, and we operate a North American-wide network to inform conservation of at-risk species and ecosystems. And the Biodiversity Indicators Program is actually our global arm that we uh, collaborate with partners around the world to build uh, robust biodiversity monitoring and reporting systems. Now, uh, for those of you that didn't join the first session of this series, um, we're really exploring the intersection between AI and biodiversity knowledge and conservation, and also exploring some of the challenges that we face in applying AI and machine learning techniques. Um, and as a conservation biologist, AI is just one of many tools in our toolbox, uh, but one that's really growing in, in leaps and bounds. Um, and we're seeing a lot of effort not just in, in improving the programming language and the interface uh, that operates AI, but creatively how people are taking these opportunities and applying them to different conservation challenges. And you'll certainly hear that in this session. And uh, I'm really excited about this session. Uh, we're gonna learn about how AI is driving uh, a platform called iNaturalist. And I'm an active iNaturalist user and, and maybe even bigger fan. Um, it, it, this is a, a platform that's really transformed uh, biodiversity data and the provision of biodiversity data globally. Um, so a lot of what's collected through this platform goes into something called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and it's a huge pipeline of data. And what's cool about this, this platform is it's not just scientists like me that collect data and use it, um, but even people down the street from me. So there's a couple of farmers that live near me that are really active users of iNaturalist. And probably my friends and family are getting pretty tired of me to, to tell them to, to download this app. Um, but I do, because it's really amazing for connecting people to nature and really understanding nature in your own backyard. Um, so with that, I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to, uh, to introduce Dr. Scott Lowry. 
and he's the co-director of iNaturalist. Uh, Scott has both a bachelor and master's of science degree in biology from Stanford and a PhD in environmental science uh, at Duke. And before working at iNaturalist full-time, Scott was a research fellow at the Global Ecology Department at the Carnegie Institute for Science and a lecturer in the Department of Geography at UC Berkeley with research focusing on global biodiversity loss from African elephants uh, to California flora. And since 2011, Scott's been directing the organizational development at INAT. And today we're gonna learn more about the machine learning models that iNaturalist maintains and use and how they're trained and deployed throughout the platform. So welcome, Scott. Thanks for doing this and, and the floor is yours. Great, well, thank you so much, Mike. It's uh, great to have the opportunity to, to talk to everybody. Um, let me just share my screen a second. Great. Yeah, well, I'll just jump right into it. So um, so my name is Scott Laurie, and iNaturalist is a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. And when I was thinking about how to structure this talk, I was really inspired by um, Andrew Gonzalez's previous talk in this series. So I definitely encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to go back and and uh, and watch it, because I think it... Um, it really laid out a, a great framework for thinking about some of these challenges. So in this talk, I wanted to start by sort of reiterating these challenges, but also opportunities that we have with um, biodiversity as part of the global biodiversity framework that was that was just announced. Um, and then talk about, uh, you know, the advantages of citizen science and iNaturalist is a citizen science site. Some people call it community science to try to be a bit more inclusive. I'm just going to stick with, with citizen science, but um, uh, the same thing um, as the advantages of citizen science towards towards meeting this challenge and then talk about why ai i think is particularly well suited for citizen science as sort of a, as a complement to it and then go specifically into um i naturalist computer vision ai which is something that we started in 2017 so we've been refining it for about six years now and then some of the new ai work we're doing on species distribution modeling and essentially really trying to get some of these essential biodiversity variables that are going to be important for meeting these biodiversity challenges and lastly, again, inspired by Andrew uh, Gonzalez's talk, talk a little bit about these decision support cycles that his talk focused on and so give some examples within iNaturalist. Um, so the the as as was covered in the previous talk, um, biodiversity is under incredible threat. So our um, not only do the, do the biosphere related goals underpin all of the other sustainable development goals. So these really are critical to, to meeting the UN sustainable development goals. Um, but the the statistics are are pretty grim. You know, 25% of species are threatened with extinction, and um, it's expected to get worse over the next uh, the next decades. Um, but at the same time, we have a tremendous opportunity. So uh, uh, the global biodiversity framework that was just announced um, last fall, you know, it really present presents a really important opportunity for us to think about how to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. Um, which is, was one of the one of the main goals that was set out by that um, framework, and then also you know one thing that came up again and again in the framework, which I thought was was really interesting, but also very interesting and, and encouraging, was um, the framework really stresses the importance of indigenous peoples and local communities, and, and and I think sets up a bit of a of a, a challenge, which is how do we not only really implement these these drastic measures, but do this in a way that uh, stresses local communities. Um, and so I just wanted to start by saying that I think one of the key advantages of citizen science is that it inherently emphasizes local communities. Um, so iNaturalist is an example of a citizen science site. It does some things that in many ways trade off with some of the data um, issues. So for example, iNaturalist prioritizes people over data. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the, the data generated by the platform belongs to the community, it belongs to the people who post the data. It's an open science platform, it's non-commercial, it, um, it's open source software open data, meaning that the data owners are encouraged to license their data so that it can be shared with external data sets, like Mike mentioned, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. It's a bottoms-up approach, so it um, it really focuses on serving on-the-ground use cases, you know, helping people connect with and understand nature in their backyards, focuses on peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, so individuals talking to individuals. Um, and it also, uh, in order to enable sort of diverse collaboration, it really, really places an emphasis on civil discourse online. It's paramount to participating in iNaturalist. And in many ways, if you can't participate civilly online, then uh, in many cases, that the, the mission or the, the expertise that you're bringing just isn't going to translate. Um, we were really excited to have a piece recently in the New York Times that 
call my naturalist the nicest place online, which I don't, don't know if that's true, but it was it's definitely what we're going for. Um, so what is iNaturalist? Well, at, at its core, our mission is to connect people to, to nature through technology. And at its core, it's a social network of people who are going out in their backyards, finding living things that interest them, butterfly, sea slug, taking a picture of it, uploading it to the community. And it's not just a picture, it's actually a biodiversity observation. So it has a location, has a date, has evidence in the form of a photo or sound. Um, and then there's a whole community of people online that range from other amateurs to um, to scientists and conservation managers who will help sort of identify these observations and put them in context. And in many cases, those observations, once they are, are vetted, go off the platform into other places like the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, where they're used in the um, scientific processes. And in many ways, some of that context and sort of cyclical behavior happens on the platform itself. And uh, I wanted to describe a, a little bit of uh, how our naturalist works, how it fits into this um, biodiversity framework, but then then specifically talk about um, the AIs that we've built and use. So um, this, this is a figure that I think captures kind of what's happening in our naturalist. And so in the next hour, so while I'm giving this talk, we expect 5,000, about 5,000 new observations, all of those orange dots are new observations. So again, we have a, a bias towards the Northern hemisphere. So um, early in the morning here in, in California, so probably not of activity, not a lot of activity now, probably a lot in Europe at the moment. And those white lines connect an identifier to an observer. So that sort of communication is really interesting because it can span um, oceans and continents and it's really a global collaboration. So by the time that I'm done talking, you know, we expect about 12,000 new identifications, um, about 200 new participants to join the community and about eight new projects. But again, these this community is made up of a big spectrum ranging from scientists to young children. Um, this is just four observations that I just wanted to pull up recently that uh, uh, members of the community posted. So you can see in every example, it's an observation of a living thing. Um, it's associated with the user. And then the, the challenge is not only to identify the organism in that, but also place that in context and say, wow, this is really interesting. This is a species that's out of range or a species that we haven't seen for a long time, or this is something very rare. Or this is a new invasive species. Um, iNaturals can be used by individuals. So going on a hike, exploring your backyard, but it's also used um, by uh, groups within the, um, the sort of biodiversity community. And uh, one big user are sort of um, protected areas. So this is a protected area in Costa Rica called Osa Conservation. And I'm a big fan of them. And they've also really integrated iNaturalist into all sorts of parts of their work on the reserve. So everything ranging from sort of basic monitoring, getting outside and figuring out what's, what's on the reserve, where and when it occurs, um, engaging local communities. So they've integrated iNaturalist into large parts of the sort of school curriculums and school groups that come to the reserve. And they've also are really using it to help um, prioritize and actually understand how their local preserve fits into the larger biodiversity context. This preserve has this frog called the uh, Golfo Dulce poison dart frog which is extremely sort of one of these hyper endemics, this entire global range is just this one peninsula in Costa Rica. And so this park, you know, carries the, a huge part of the, the fate of this whole species in its hands. And naturalist is also, we have a, a global network where within about 20 countries, we have a local version of iNaturalist and those um, local instances are all run in collaboration with um, local institutions that could be government or NGOs within the country. And that's a huge part, again, to keep this kind of citizen science, uh, local local community emphasis, deals with everything from, from translations, but also to um, common local names, indigenous names, um, ways of just presenting the whole activity in a way that um, that stays local while still having this global synthesis. And then also the partnerships with the groups uh, enable us to do th things through this collaboration that we, we would never be able to do uh, from our seats working out behind the scenes on a naturalist. For example, the um, Columbia uh, instance, which is run by the Von Humboldt Institute, which is involved in this um, series, uh, they just did a program recently, which was to take um, uh, people who had been really involved in uh, guerrilla warfare and FARC to sort of retrain them to become rangers in some of these interesting parts of Colombia that are incredibly biodiverse that have been um, really sort of torn apart by the FARC activity recently and using iNaturalist in order to sort of help them uh, 
not only become, you actually really become rangers and become people who are contributing biodiversity to help us uh, monitor these, these really important parts of the globe. And again, this is just an example of something we never would have been able to do without these collaborations. Um, and then again, keeping with the citizen science focus, you know, iNaturalist is really focused on growing this community of, of users and observers. But as this um, community grows, we're really building a capacity to for sustainable and um, ongoing biodiversity monitoring. And so you can see that this is the um, no, the number of observations per month since we started in 2008. And um, the two main signals is that we've continued to grow. So we continue to grow year over year. And then we have this seasonality because there's just more activity in the Northern Hemisphere, more land mass in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so we're actually at the sort of peak trough right now of the Northern Hemisphere winter. And then we hope in the, about March, we'll have what we call the spring bump when things will bump up again and stay high through the Northern Hemisphere summer. Um, so I've just sort of really talked about why I think citizen science is so important because it inherently places this emphasis on local communities, which um, you know is really important for us to be able to meet the goals for the global biodiversity framework, but in a way that is, that is equitable and, and um, achieves the outcomes we want. But I also really think that um, citizen science is in many ways the best bet for monitoring biodiversity. And I wanted to kind of quickly make that argument of why, why I really think that even local communities and sort of the anchor to people aside, why just only looking at its capacity to generate data, why citizen science is such an important tool um, in our arsenal. And then I promise I'll get onto AI. <laughs> but quickly going back to the, um, the GBF goals. So I remember a huge part of these goals is halting and reversing biodiversity loss. We want to do this in a smart way. So specific measurable way um, using indicators. Um, again, uh, Andrew Gonzalez's talk what, what was a very great framework for thinking about this. Um, and, and so if we really think about biodiversity, there's about 2 million species that we've named. You know, there's probably many more than that, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of species that ostensibly we need specific measurements on in order to build these indicators, in order to achieve these, these smart goals, these, these smart indicators towards, towards achieving these goals. Um, and Andrew Gonzalez and others are draw these parallels with what the IPCC has been able to do with climate in order to sort of monitor and, and track you know, anthropogenic drivers of climate change so we can see whether we're um, actually altering those trajectories. With climate, you know, there's very few um, variables involved, if you want to call them that, things like global temperature. And, and you know, th those are the things that we have to measure. With biodiversity, it's similar in a way. We want to track these um, these trends and then, and then bend the curve into, into more biodiverse, um, biodiversity positive outcomes. But we're talking about measurements on hundreds of thousands of individual species. So it really is in order to detect trends that have to be short temporal scales, because remember, we don't just want one measurement from the last century. We want to be able to measure biodiversity, ideally, you know, on a, on a, on a annual time scale. Um, that's a tremendous amount of data that we'll need to um, that we'll need to generate. And it's data that has to be on short temporal scales. It has to cover lots and lots of different species. Um, uh, and so there's big challenges there. One of the things, again, that uh, last talk talked about a lot was this unbalanced um, nature of biodiversity data. Um, and what do I mean by that? So this is a genus of butterflies. These are eight butterflies that live in the neotropics. And um, the the top uh, layer there, you can see it's sort of like a histogram. So that first species, the Tala, lives in Florida. And we have about uh, 2,500 observations on a natural. So it's a very common species um, that you see all over Florida. So as a result, because there's a lot of uh, uh, people in, in Florida who use iNaturalist, who use citizen science sites like this, we have a lot of observations of it. There's two species in Mexico where we drop down to 500 observations, and then you get down into South America and Central America, two South America species. We only have 24 observations and 11 observations. So this is what I mean by unbalanced data sets. And one of the unique issues with with citizen science remember is it's an opportunistic thing we're not it's not in many cases it's not zero sum it's not like we're we're hiring someone for a dollar to generate an observation we're opportunistically hoping that people use the platform and, uh, and upload observations and there's certain things we can certainly do so like i mentioned with the iNaturalist network to promote outreach in south america maybe start up a local butterfly club and and among the naturalist community or in schools to try to drive participation there 
But in many cases, this unbalanced um, nature of these data sets is going to persist. Maybe iNaturalist will grow, we'll, we'll build a better uh, platform, and we'll get more of all these butterflies. So we might get enough of this data on these species where we don't have very much data now, but we're also going to get another thousand observations of Atala. So I, I tend to think of these as it's not a problem that we have unbalanced data set. We just want to make sure that we're sort of growing the whole pie and making sure that we have enough data in order to build these indicators and achieve these goals in places um, like like the the neotropics where we where we might always have a lot less data than in places like Europe and um and North America. So it's not so much unbalancing the data because we really have to opportunistically uh, get data where we can, but it's growing the whole pie. I think that's an important part of this. So um and then the second aspect is the short temporal time scale. So again, we want to make sure that we can do these um do this monitoring ideally from year to year. I really like this quote that Andrew Gonzalez put in his talk about um, this quote from Stott that says, you know, we want to develop monitoring systems and tools that can deliver rapid and reproducible assessments, not many years later. So in that spirit, I went to the Global Biodiversity Framework, GBA. So this is a place that iNaturalist, along with 81,000 other biodiversity data sets, share data um, and it aggregates this data and really is a, GBA is a, is a core part of really our understanding of what biodiversity is. So in many ways, although not all biodiversity data is in, is in GBIF. It's a great place to sort of get a sense for what kind of biodiversity data is out there. So I went to GBIF last night and I just searched for data from birds from 2020. So this is the last couple of years, which is a, it, kind of arbitrary, but it's a good sense. It's a, for me, it was sort of when the pandemic started, it's a good milestone to think about when, um, you know, what what recently happened and if you haven't been able to sort of get data mobilized into GBIF since 2020 it's probably too slow for the um GBF time scales that we're talking about where we really want to make serious progress towards measuring these goals by 2030. so <clears throat> if you take all the bird data on GBIF from 2020 then I use I use some data that GBIF has on sort of pooling these data sets into citizen science and non-citizen science data sets and this is just the citizen science data. And it's plotted on the x-axis is the number of bird species. So we know there's about 10,000, 11,000 bird species in the, in the world. And then on the y-axis is how many observations we have of each of those species. So on the far left, you know, American robin, that's the most observed birds among these citizen science data sets on GBIF. There's about 6 million observations from the last three years. So we have plenty of data on American robin. This is on a log-log axis because otherwise it just really looks like, a, like an elbow. But it's that same feature that I talked about with the butterfly. This is the unbalanced long tail distribution. And then if you go over to the right side, you see that that one bird, which is a, um, the, the Nullabor quail thrush, which is a bird from Australia, a very small range bird. We only have 102 observations of it. So these are the kind of long tail unbalanced distributions that I'm talking about. And again, I don't think we're going to be able to get a lot more data from Nullabor quail thrush without getting more American robin observations as our sort of monitoring capacity grows globally. But like I'm saying, that's not so much a problem. We just want to make sure we have enough data for some of these rare overlooked parts of the globe, like places where Nullarbor thrush, <laughs> the birders are going to kill me, Nullarbor quail thrush um, live. So that line is the citizen science data. And again, we want to remember, we want a lot of species. So we, we also want a lot of data. We want both. Right? If we had Lots of observations of just one species, that would be a problem. But then again, if we had one observation of every bird species, that would be a problem. We want enough data for enough species. And I think these kind of graphs do a good job of capturing that balance. So I'm going to show a couple of these. But then here's the non-citizen science data sets on IGBA from the same, um, the same time period. And remember, keep in mind, these are log-log plots. So that's actually a huge difference. We're talking about orders of magnitude difference. So no question that for birds, citizen science dominates and it's really due to the efforts of groups like eBird which out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology which has just done an incredible job of really growing and mobilizing the birding community as a as a biodiversity monitoring force <clears throat> um and so again this is using 11,000 species of birds globally which maybe is the right number but you can say that like how much is enough data so let's say enough data is 100 observations you know we have 100 observations with the citizen science data sets for almost 70% of birds so significant portion. If you say, well, that's not enough. We need a thousand observations every year. Um, you know, that's a smaller percentage, but you compare that to the, using the non-citizen science data, data sets. And it's just clear, at least for birds, 
that the non-citizen science data isn't scaling fast enough. Citizen science data is critical for getting the kind of scales of data we need, probably to have enough data on enough species to really do the kind of monitoring, to drive the kind of predictive modeling and indicators that we, that we need. Um, this is a taking that same data, but I kind of like this graph, um, thinking about it in terms of the percentage of birds what percentage of birds, what percentage of their data come from, from uh, citizen science data sets? So if remember for, because that's on a log scale, the last graph I showed, thousands of birds, the only data we have from the last three years is from citizen science. So that's where it's 100% for, you know, a huge percentage of birds, about 80%, 100% um, of their data the last three years has come from citizen science, sites like eBird. And then we have that, um, you know, drops off and there's a few birds where they actually have more data coming from the traditional data sets. Um, but if you look at that, intersection of those uh, of that curve, where does the number, the percentage of birds that have at least that percentage of their observations from citizen science, it's 97%. This is kind of what we think about in academia, the H index, you know, how many papers do I have with how many citations? I have at least X number of, of papers with that number of citations. And it's just a nice statistic, sort of H index statistics. We're trying to capture, um, you know, a two-dimensional thing like this. We want to have a lot of um, you want to, if for it to be a successful data set, you want a large percentage of your um, of your uh, uh, your species to have this characteristic of having a large percentage of their observations coming from your data set. So in this case, clear the clear winner is birds. I mean, it's citizen science. Ninety seven percent of the of the bird species have at least ninety seven percent of their observations from citizen science from the last three years, according to GBIF. So that's great. But what's the problem with this? Well, the big problem is that. Birds only represent about 0.6% of named species. So like I said, there's about 2 million named species. That's like, that number is actually growing. We suspect there's probably more like 10 million species out there. Um, but birds are just, ver all vertebrates represent just a tiny fraction of that. The big players are insects, about a million named insects, plants, about 350,000 species of plants, large groups, uh, large representation among other groups like spiders, arachnids, mollusks, things like that. So um I wanted to kind of continue that analysis and say, how does citizen science hold up for some of these other groups, some of these non-bird groups? And we know that citizen science is so successful uh, with birds, but how about these other groups? <clears throat> so the first thing I wanted to do is, um, is you know, before I was looking at citizen science versus non-citizen science on eBird, but I just wanted to only consider iNaturalist. So this will only be iNaturalist versus everything else on, on GBIF. Uh, for the same three-year period from 2020 to 2023. Why just iNaturalist? Well, iNaturalist is very unique in that it's it's one of the only large citizen science sites that's all tax and global. As a result, it's been able to collect data on about 100,000 species, over 100,000 species. So this was a, a figure from the GBIF blog in 2019. And at that point, you can see um, iNaturalist isn't the most, doesn't have the most occurrences by any means. So groups like eBird, Art Poltalen, which is a all species dated by a uh, citizen science site in Sweden, have more observations, but you can see they have less species. You know, eBird is always going to have that ceiling of, of 10 to 11,000 species because that's the number of bird species. Uh, Sweden, the Art Poltalen site, they're doing plants and insects, but they're in, only in, in Northern Europe where there just isn't that biodiversity. So iNaturalist has data on hundreds of thousands of species. We currently have over 400,000 species. And that puts it close to, for example, what the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, which is a traditional museum that's been, you know, collecting more physical specimens than citizen science specimens, but its representation on GBIF is similar as about 500,000 uh, species represented. So what I'm going to show now is just iNaturalist versus everything else on, um, on GBIF for the last three years to try to get these similar sort of statistics about what percentage of iNatural citizen science data is, is contributing to the whole picture that we have on GBIF. Um, but quickly, wh why do we, um, you know, how has iNatural been able to get to this large number of 100,000 species? Um, and the, 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 secret, the secret to this is, is collaborative identification. If you think about bird watching or what eBird's doing, you know, the, the citizen scientist is really both the observer and the identifier. They'll go off and they'll watch a bunch of birds, but they'll also say, oh, I saw a titmouse, I saw a chickadee, and they're observing the birds, but they're also identifying them. On iNaturalist, because it's a platform where people are sharing evidence, sharing photos, um, we've distributed that identification. And a neat, uh, a neat outcome of the site being a global collaboration site is that um, whereas most observing is local, so if I was to observe, I'd mostly be here in Northern California doing that, but a lot of the identifying 
is really globally distributed. So here's our four of sort of top identifiers on the site. And they each have sort of taxonomic specialties. So Wangun lives in South Korea, but he specializes on um, the group of insects called true bugs. Jay Wednes uh, is in North America, focuses on mammals and squirrels. Boris B is in Berlin, focuses on beetles. So you can see by having this collaboration, this global collaboration, um, it's a really unique kind of uh, collaboration between people who are geographically focused, observing in their backyards, but maybe observing squirrels, true bugs, mollusks, and beetles. And then these identifiers who are living in different parts of the globe, but are contributing their expertise to observations all around the planet. So I think that's one of the reasons why Naturalist has been able to, uh, co this collaboration between identifiers and observers has been able to result in such a large number of species. Um, and also this, this collaboration, identify, identification collaboration can go back and forth. So this is an example, I'm, this is a group I'm very interested in, which are these pill millipedes. But so I'm having this conversation on a naturalist with these, this is a group of, of, of uh, millipedes that don't live where I, I live in California, but I'm very interested in them. And really back and forth, because a lot of these species um, have their identification characters or what we call museum characters. They're not obvious in a photograph. You know, they're small morphological details. In this case, you have to sort of peel this thing open and look at its reproductive organs. And I can go back and forth with these observers and we're sort of jointly collaborating and trying to figure out what these things are by, they'll take pictures of them, I'll do research and we'll and we'll get to, get to species. So that's, those are, I think, the two reasons why a naturalist has been able to produce um, really monitoring capacity for hundreds of thousands of species, which, as I mentioned earlier, is, a, is, a, is an important part of this if we really want to build uh, monitoring frameworks for biodiversity that, that aren't just using small groups like birds as sort of proxies for everything else. <clears throat> so what does it look like if we take um, just iNaturalist versus all other GBIF records for this 2030 period? So that top two graphs are birds, the same graphs I showed before. And as no surprise, iNaturalist does not contribute a lot to the whole pool of birds on GBIF. Even though iNaturalist has a lot of bird data, so you see for some species we have you know, 100,000 observations on the y-axis and you know, for, we have data on pretty much all 10,000 species, but other is much higher. And why is that? Because it includes things like, like eBird, which is huge um, and really dominates the sort of citizen science and just all bird observation capacity globally. So that H index statistic, iNaturalist only contributes 10% of, of species contribute at least 10% of observations from iNat. So iNaturalist, even though it has a lot of bird data, it's not a big player globally in the bird data. But how about these other groups? So look at mammals. So um, you can see those two lines look quite different. The other line starts out higher, and that's because, again, it's skewed towards some of these um, European citizen science sites like Art Portalen that have just a tremendous amount of data, but it's just from Sweden. So it's a lot of the same species overrepresented. So the, the top species there on that other graph is roe deer. You know, there's just Europe has produced hundreds of thousands of, of roe deer observations, but just for that one species. But then you can see how the iNaturalist line crosses. And it actually, remember, this is on a log scale. A lot of species of mammals are only represented by iNaturalist. So if we use that H index graph on, um, on mammals, you can see that 63% of mammal species in GBIF have at least 63% of their data from iNaturalist. So here's a case where iNaturalist actually in citizen science, but iNaturalist specifically, really is producing a huge amount of the data for mammals. How about some other groups? So this is reptiles, and you see a similar graph, but here they don't actually cross. But so 81% of the um, of the uh, reptile species on GBIF have at least 81% of their observations from iNaturalist. And amphibians, a little bit lower, but similar story, 73% of the amphibians on, on, on GBIF from the last three years have at least 73% of their observations from iNaturalist. But these are sort of the terrestrial vertebrate groups, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals. What happens if we look at the two big players, um, uh, insects and, and birds, uh, sorry, insects and plants. But there we get about the similar story. So other chordates, so that's mostly fish, but other things like tunicates, about 64% of the species on GBIF have at least 64% of their data on iNaturalist from iNaturalist. 64% of the insects on GBIF have at least 64% of their data for the last three years for my naturalist and 62% of the plants. So all told, it's um, 60%. So 60% of the records on GBIF from the last three years are from my naturalist uh, or of the species have at least 60% of their data from my naturalist. So we can say that most GBIF records, records of most species from the last three years have most of their data from my naturalist. 
So again, this is, um, and I, I'll move on to AI now, but I think this is important, um, this argument I'm trying to make that citizen science data uh, is, is, a, is a really important uh, option that we have. I mean, we, we, we want and we will have technological breakthroughs for other things like um, eDNA and uh, remote sensing, camera trapping and things like that. But at the moment, when we really talk about monitoring biodiversity, which is hundreds of thousands of species, citizen science is kind of the only game we have in town. And so while we, we will have and we want these other technological breakthroughs, I think it's really important to recognize that not even from a social local community emphasis um, standpoint, which I mentioned, which is I think a tremendous part of the, of the appeal of citizen science, but also just purely nuts and bolts from a, are we generating enough data capacity? Citizen science is data is generating data on short time scales. You know, every this is just looking at through the past three years, which is pretty short time scale on the bio, you know, as far as biodiversity is concerned, um, across hundreds of thousands of species. Uh, it really is the only kind of a game we have in town right now for generating this kind of data that we need to to do a lot of um, biodiversity monitoring. So now I wanted to quickly jump into um, uh, why I think AI complements citizen science and why um, why AI is such a good partner for citizen science data sets. And think about what AI is good for, but also what it's what it's bad for. So what is AI good for? Well, it's good for unbalanced data sets. We talked a lot about these unbalanced data sets. AI is incredibly good at dealing with um, situations like this, where we have 6 million observations of Robin and only a couple data set points of other things. It's also good for data sets that have relatively high error, which citizen science data is a part of. It's good for data sets that's unstructured, which is kind of how these opportunistic citizen science data sets are. Um, it's also important to recognize what AI isn't. You know, it's um, AI is really bad at understanding why it's making these predictions. I mean, think of chat GPT. You get these incredible outcomes. We don't really know how accurate they are. We don't really know um, why it's predicting what it is. I, I think of AI in many ways. It's, it really is the thousand monkeys on a thousand keyboards. It's, it's really good at synthesizing data. Um, it's kind of like autocomplete, right? You think of chat GPT, but also a naturalist. When you use computer vision identification, it's sort of just auto-completing. Maybe I already know what the species is, is but it's just typing it in faster than I could. Um, so AI is very good for just synthesizing and summarizing these really large data sets, like these citizen science data sets that a person can't get their head around. But it's not really good at adding anything new. If that information isn't already in that data set, it's not going to add it for you. It's just going to make it more accessible. And it's really not science in many ways. The science is involved in evaluating these models and evaluating how good they are, and also in applying these AIs to answer other questions, like you know, if we really wanted to stop biodiversity loss. So I think people confuse AI with, with science in many ways, and they're related, but they're not exactly the same. So what how have we used AI within iNaturalist? Well, the you know, with the early days of iNaturalist and everything I've talked up to this point really was limited to participants generating data identifying that data, getting that data out there in the scientific community. Um, because that data was out there in the scientific community, we started seeing a lot of machine learning papers using our naturalist data, and we started to really interact with that community. So specifically, this is a community of, of machine learning collaborators uh, at, a, at Visipedia, which is a, a couple labs from various universities, including Caltech and Cornell. Um, specifically, I want to call it Grant Van Horn and Oshim Akwara who um, have been huge uh, collaborators for us for building these AI models within iNaturalist. There's also been challenges. They put on these um, iNaturalist challenges at conferences like the CVPR annual conference, the Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference, which has been a great way to kind of bring together machine learning researchers with other communities. Like we're sort of more from the ecological citizen science community. And it's been a great, a great um, opportunity to learn from one another. But what we did, so we integrated this computer vision model into this Framework. So now we have participants adding data, talking about and adding identifications, but also AI is working alongside that community and helping add identifications. So now integrated all through our naturalists, we've been doing this since 2017, there are AIs that will be suggesting identifications. So if you take a picture of a violet, you might still know it's a violet or someone in the community might know, but the AI will actually be saying, hey, I think this is a violet. Here's the one, top ones I suggest. That's just really supercharged this whole community um, activity. Again, it's not adding a lot of new information that's not in the community already. If the community doesn't know how to identify something, the AI certainly hasn't learned it. But it sort of synthesizes and brings all this together in an incredibly useful tool. 
It's also enabled us to do things that we couldn't do before. We've always wanted iNaturalist to be more accessible to kids, but because iNaturalist involves this community interaction, it's always been um, something that you can't do if you're under 13. But once we had this AI, we wrapped it in a, in a, a privacy-focused app for kids that has badges and is really fun called Seek. And Seek's now been downloaded over 10 million times. It's much more popular than iNaturalist because I think it appeals to this larger audience of sort of non-naturalist amateurs. And that's an audience we never could have, have reached if we had didn't have this AI that kind of enables you to, to build this sort of activity into a privacy-focused app. And it's been great just to see, especially during the pandemic, and we saw so many uh, great tweets of kids out there, you know, using Seek, and, and, and it's just a great way to be involved that we couldn't do if we didn't have these AI tools. <clears throat> so now I want to move on to how do we train these models? Well, essentially, again, looking again at this uh, unbalanced, skewed distribution, we just take all the species that we have, what we call enough data. And we talked a lot about what does enough data mean, but for these purposes of computer vision modeling, about a hundred observation. So those first four butterflies are included in the model as classes. We're making predictions on them. We're not yet making predictions on those other two butterflies, but we will when we have enough data. So when we started this in 2017, we had 25,000 species where we had enough data to really include in the model. And now every month, you know, we're, we're now retraining a model and we're now dealing with about 70,000 species and we're getting about one to th one to 2,000 new species every every month, every time we train the model. This is how our sort of training and release structure. So we used to train these models a lot longer. Um, now we're using a sort of combination of transfer learning and then and then training a whole new model. So for example, our version one, that's that's off of one model that was trained from scratch over about a year. But then every month, we can do a transfer learning model. So that's version um, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. And then in the background, we've been training this whole model from scratch, version two. And then we'll start, we start just started releasing 2.1, 2.2 on the same monthly time scale. So this enables us to really update these models very quickly, but also make sure that as the fundamental characteristics of the data change, let's say we get whole new groups of organisms or whole new geographies, that the models know about those. So that's been a kind of a fun release schedule. So this last, again, as, as I mentioned, we're releasing a model every month. We're getting about one to 2,000 new species, new classes in the model per month. So this last one, we've got 400 new plant species, 14 new amphibians, and these are the actual 14 new amphibians. So all of those ones, maybe we had observations on our naturals, but it was under that 100 you know, threshold. And now that we have them, they're, they're in the model, we're making estimates, and we're improving those estimates every time we get more data. So then the next thing I want to talk about was computer vision is very cool, very fun. Um, I feel like before chat, GT, jet, chat GPT and all this generative AI, it was kind of the sexy AI topic. But we were, we're very interested in how can we use AI to actually try to get at some of these essential biodiversity variables. Um, uh, Giovanni's done such a great job of, um, of coming up with exactly what are the indicators that we need to do to meet things like the, the GBF goals. So so that's not going to be so much computer modeling. That's right. That's going to be kind of understanding where and when species are in space and time. How are these distributions changing? A lot of the essential biodiversity data bases really deal with this sort of distributional phenological aspect of where species are and how those are changing so we can get trends over time. So this, in many ways, it's a very similar model. It um, it just takes all the data and the naturals across all the species. And, but instead of training a computer vision model off of the photos associated with those observations, it's training a distribution model off of all the locations in space and time associated with that model. So here, are the, for example, salamander just, just points. And the kind of most vanilla version of this model kind of creates this blurry distribution like that. And again, it's not using that's not using any covariate data, no temperature, no elevation, anything like that. But it is looking across all the species. So it's sort of saying, wow, you know, so I'm a nude, I occur here. I tend to also occur with these other terrestrial things. I don't tend to occur, occur with these fish. So I'm going to know not to kind of bleed into the ocean too much. And that's, like I said, it's sort of that ability to synthesize, to look across hundreds of millions of observations across hundreds of thousands of species. It's not adding anything that's not there, but it's able to sort of synthesize that and get an understanding that I think has really been absent from a lot of distribution modeling work, you know, just ability to really look at that big data aspect of it, which is what AI is so good for. Um, so what are some of the applications that we're using this model for? We're, we're, we're really, as I mentioned, this, the computer vision we've been doing since 2017, we're really just rolling out these 
sort of um, uh, geospatial um, AI models. So one of the lowest hanging fruits is and a huge uh, issue in um, um, biodiversity monitoring and, and biodiversity action is understanding invasive species, any sort of anomaly, early springs, changes in phenology, but also invasive species is one. You know, these are species that are popping up in many cases, agricultural pests in places where they weren't known. Um, this has been happening a lot on iNaturalist very manually. For example, this spider, which is a Southeast Asian spider, it showed up in um, Rio de Janeiro. Someone found it on iNaturalist and published a whole paper. You know, this is a new, new report of Asian jumping spider in Brazil. But um, using this model as kind of an anomaly detector, we were able to see that this species is now also in Manaus. So we're hoping to kind of, by deploying this an anomaly detector into our community, we can help kind of supercharge this work of finding weird observations, early springs, you know, big wash up of dead fish along the coast, um, invasive species and help sort of highlight them, surface them to the community so that they can um, they can be vetted and acted on more quickly. Another important part is, is actually producing these indicators that we need in order to achieve things like the, the GBF goals. So a huge, I think really interesting uh, core metric of a species is its range size, right? How big is this is the size of that range? That's a that's a metric that's very closely tied to conservation status. So generally, other factors like poaching or specific threats aside, um, species that have large ranges are pretty well protected because they occur in lots of places. You have your eggs distributed in lots of baskets. But small range species, species that only occur on one mountain or you know one island, are, are very threatened. So can we use iNaturalist data and these kind of AI models to get a sense of of range size. That's something that I'm very personally interested in. We've been doing a ton of work to try to figure out how well can we do this at what spatial scales and how does it compare to more traditional data sets like the IUCN range map. So that's a species where you can see on the top is our modeled range and on the bottom is sort of the ground truth, even though it's not perfect, but that's the that's what we're sort of using as a benchmark. Um, we've been doing a lot of the work on trying to sort of combine covariate. So traditional distribution modeling is really just looking at one species. So maybe this globe lily environmental covariates and figuring out what its ecological niche is. And one of the big problems with this is that you'll predict the niche all around the world. So this is a California species. If you use these traditional approaches, you'll predict it in Chile, which is kind of makes sense. It has a similar climate, but the species doesn't occur in Chile. It's on the other side of the, of the hemisphere. Um, this is sort of zooming in and seeing what the traditional maxit model is. And those problems happen on local scales too like this species does not occur north of the uh san francisco bay but you can see max it just projects it up there because it has a similar climate these ai models and this is again the ai model not using any covariate data just again all it's looking at is all the other species they behave very differently i mean these they have a very good sense of what it kind of means to be a species sort of an inherent sense of biogeography um, they know, wow, a lot of species kind of do this thing where we go down this, what must be a mountain range here, even though it's not looking at any covariate data, and they kind of capturing that. Um, but then there's, but there's places where we don't have a lot of data, like the ocean has no idea. So it just bleeds out into there because we don't have a lot of data from the ocean. But then you take like that north of the San Francisco Bay, and we have a lot of data there, and it's not of that species. So it's like, hmm, I don't really co-occur with anything that lives up there. I think I don't occur there. So these um, AI models which sort of are looking across all these different hundreds of thousands of species, know about what it means to be a species in a very different and complementary way to these sort of niche models that I showed earlier. So what we've been doing is combining these things. What happens if we take these AI models, take advantage of that AI deep, net, deep learning, uh, machine learning part of it, but also add in these environmental covariates to give a species a sense of its sort of what it knows about its biogeography, where it tends to co-occur with other species, but also knows about similar climates. And that's that's where we've been getting the best models. So we've been kind of running with that to um, make these distributions. And then a huge amount of the work, and this is all stuff we're doing right now. We haven't really released this, so sort of hot, hot off the press, but um, is then evaluating these distributions with the IUCN ranges. So for example, on that uh, map on the left, the green is where we predict a species to be and IUCN does as well. The yellow is where IUCN predicts it, but we don't predict it. And then the uh, blue, purple is where we predict it, IUCN doesn't. So looking at the sort of true positives, false positives, and trying to get a sense for how well are we doing for this subset of species, about 10,000, where we have IUCN range maps. And we can look at kind of our model diversity and the test diversity, IUCN, and see, do we have any sort of systemic biases? Are we able to capture these sort of metrics that we're interested in, looking at the false negatives, the false positives? 
Um, but what I'm excited about is we seem to be able to, to reproduce this core metric, which is range size. This is something that we're obviously very interested in from conservation um, extinction kind of um, thinking. So on the x-axis is the uh, range size uh, from the IUCN range maps. And on the uh, y-axis is our modeled range maps using the best approach we're able to do right now. So you can see, we're still getting it a little bit wrong for these very small range species. Um, we tend to over predict, but we have a very good correlation there. And what I think is neat about this is if we look at that, the total diversity of the top right graph for all those 70,000 species that we have, we know that's a biased subset. That subset is going to be biased towards species where we have a lot of our naturalist activity. So species in Europe, species in North America, we know there's a ton of diversity in the, tro the tropics. We're not getting that there. So we know that's a bio biased sample of diversity of the of the 2 million native species. That's a biased 70,000. But the question is, are these distributions of some of these characteristics, like the small range species, we're very interested in understanding where small range species are as conservation biologists. And if we look at the distribution of small range species from that 70,000 set, set, we get what we, what we think is a much more this is the answer we kind of always get. Where are the small range species? Well, they're in the sort of Brazilian Atlantic coast. They're in sort of the neotropics in Mexico and down through Colombia. They're in South America, which has an incredible uh, endemic flora at places like Southeast Asia and Australia. So even though our subset might be biased towards, place, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a portfolio of species, um, a lot of these metrics that we want to get, like where are the small range species within that sample might might uh, not be biased. So I think that's really exciting to think about. So the last thing I wanted to um, I wanted to talk about is, um, uh, again, building off of Andy Gar uh, Gonzalez's talk is these sort of decision support cycles. He had, I just grabbed the slide from him. <laughs> you can even see him giving the talk, but uh, talking about these you know communities, and this is again, kind of in the context of Geobon, um, generating observations, running these observations through these sort of AI models to produce these, uh, detect these indicators and also trends in these indicators over time, and then feeding that back to the community. So that's obviously fantastic. And we're, we're participating in this in little ways. We know in a sort of very manual sense, this is happening on iNaturalist via projects, not using any of this high-tech AI or modelings, but here's a, a, a kind of an activity that was just written up about in the New York Times where, you know, people want to, this is a project on the right here where these little salamanders cross the road. And every time they cross the road, they get hit by cars. So this group wants to put underpasses, little culverts essentially under the road to reduce mortality. So they're doing that cycle. They're, they're generating the data. They're looking at the data, making a sort of manual, not super sophisticated, but, you know, predictions of where they should put that culvert in. They put the culvert in, they should be able to see that they've changed the distribution of, of newt mortality. So that's happening on the platform, but in a very manual sense. We also know that iNaturalist is contributing to these off platform through getting the data into GBIF and things in, in sort of really exciting ways. Um, this is a paper that I really like that was recently in science talking about butterfly fly declines across the West. And it was able to show this sort of trend, these, these detect these, these trends like um, Andrew Gonzalez was talking about, which is really the holy grail here with biodiversity. They were able to detect these with sort of smaller, more traditional data sets, but they were also able to get the same signal with iNaturalist data that, wow, the actual uh, trends of these butterflies is changing and decreasing over time, which is really, really exciting. But that's what we're doing now. But what we would love to do is be able to use these AI tools, especially sort of distribution indicator predictions that I was just talking about on platform to try to make it easier for the community to do its work of actually decision support, prioritizing and, and stewarding and improving local biodiversity. So this is a kind of example of, of sort of the vision. This is a credible um, botanist that uses iNaturalist named Heather Holm. And she runs these bio blitzes, which bio blitz is a big thing you do on iNaturalist where you bring the community together and observe as many species as you can um, across, this is uh, in Minnesota. But in addition to sort of that monitor activity, this has a real stewardship goal. They'll put up these signs and they'll say, look, we're not only going to try to monitor as many species as we can find here, but we're going to rip out these invasive plants and we're going to plant these, these native um, plants and we're going to bring back the pollinators. We're going to bring back endangered uh, species like the rusty patch bumblebee. So there is this aspect of monitoring, but there's also this aspect of like, we're going to improve the habitat. We're going to restore. We're going to bring back species. And what kind of tools could I naturalist provide this community doing this kind of work to do it better. So again, this is just a cartoon, but here's the vision, you know, there's a degraded creek, a degraded bank, maybe an agricultural field. 
what kind of species does this place have? It's going to be the weedy large range species, the, the cabbage white butterfly that occurs on every, every <laughs> weedy agricultural field on the planet. Let's say that group does some restoration. They bring back some of the riparian vegetation. Can they see in the signal of, of species that they're actually be able to observe, they bring back some of the riparian species like the dragonflies, maybe some of the endangered fish, and actually shift that portfolio over from the sort of large range weedy species to these smaller endemic localized species. Um, so we were doing, the last thing I want to say is just we were doing some of this um, piloting recently. This is a preserve in here in California called the Wilbur Hot Springs Preserve. And just doing that kind of portfolio analysis. So according to our geo model, this is the sort of distribution of the species. I guess just a sam sample, but the 2,000 species in our model of those 70,000 that occur in this reserve, according to our model, these are as you sort of sorted them by range size. So you can see on the right hand side, these are all the large range kind of weedy species, wild boar, which is a big invasive species. Star thistle occurs in every Mediterranean climate, wild teasel similarly. Those are sort of the weedy species on the right. And if we go over on the left, these are the small range endemics of so the blue oaks. The blue oak wo wo woodland is a very iconic California endangered ecosystem. All the little species that are local to California, the, the coral gold wasps, and then the two sort of flagship plants are the adobe lily and the Hoover's lamashum, which I just want to, those are, those are those two species. But so this is that sort of portfolio of species, giving land managers just a sense of what do they have on their land that's important that really should be prioritized and targeted. That's a huge first step. But then as that cartoon sort of illustrated, can we actually show that portfolio shifting towards the more uh, local endemic species through these conservation actions and this kind of iterative cycle um, aspect that, that Andrew Gonzalez talked about? And I think that's really the holy grail. And I think we're close. So in conclusion, I just want to summarize what I went through. So I, I talked, um, you know, the, the next decade has huge opportunities and challenges for biodiversity, huge opportunities with the GBF. I talked about how citizen science, I think, is so important because it builds in this emphasis on local communities, which is a huge uh, priority that we have. But also, even if you just look at it from a purely data standpoint, no question that it's playing a leading role in biodiversity monitoring. AI is a great complementary partner for citizen science data sets. It, it is the tool that we need to make sense of and make predictions from these data because these data sets are so large and so messy. Um, I just talked specifically about our computer vision model, which we've been iterating on since 2017. We're currently modeling about 70,000 species. And then I talked about this new geo model that we're just started doing with 70,000 species to really try to get directly at predictions of these biodiversity indicators that we'll need to meet things like the GBF goals. And then last thing is just that I think there's tremendous opportunities to further engage these uh, communities like the citizen science community and naturalists, not just to monitor, but actually to have on the ground conservation impacts. They wanna do this work. They just need decision support uh, mechanisms and tools to, to, do, to have that impact. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Scott. Incredible talk. Um, it's amazing to think uh, where iNaturalist has come, but but what's still to come? It's it's ab absolutely mind boggling in terms of the uh, the opportunities that you have before you. So we're going to go to to questions that are are scrolling in. So I'll try and keep track of them as they spin, and we'll try and cover as many as we can. Um, one one uh, maybe we can start with this one. So you talked about uh, the geospatial models, um, and 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 you also talked about growing that biodiversity data pie and the the inequalities, the spatial and taxonomic inequalities that we have. Any thoughts on how you could apply AI to, to mine that data and, and maybe other data sets like the IUCN range maps, GBIF records writ large to, to identify efforts where we might wanna motivate the citizen science community to go to that particular area to try and uh, um, confirm the, the location or, or the presence or absence of a particular species. Any thoughts on how you, you might want to use AI to, to sort of more optimally sample and motivate your community? Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. And I mean, I think that's a great, would be a great application of for this geo modeling that I talked about, you know, is if we could actually say, hey, here's something where we really expect this species here, but we haven't seen it there. Or you could even, as you're mentioning, say, what are the sort of optimal places to get data that will optimally improve these predictions and, and um, yeah, fantastic. And I think again, the iteration between the community and the AI, uh, the AI is not 
it, you know, it really is just a synthesis of the community, but it can help guide the community in a really important and valuable way. Cool. Great. Okay. So, so we're hang on Scott for the ride because I try and capture as many of these as we can. So we've got, we've got uh, some messages uh, or questions coming in. Um, and I'm just going to read them out because I don't even have time to distill them. Uh, since large language models have shown good few shot performance when prompted carefully, might multimodal image text models require just a few images per species to identify them? Is that being investigated? So perhaps that's, do you really need 100 as your threshold, or can you narrow that range in terms of minimum observations for your, your vision models? Uh, yeah, I think that's possible for sure. And um, I, a lot of the work that I mentioned our Visipedia colleagues are doing is thinking, for example, you have these sort of base models where everything up to the last layers is just really good visual representation, knows a lot about species. And then, for example, let's say you wanted to train an AI that can distinguish, let's say, mating lizards from mating, lizards that aren't mating. You know, if you could just, they've done some experiments where you just sprinkle on a few images of sort of mating versus non-mating lizards, and then are able to train up that AI that will do a really good job of, you know, exactly what you're saying, mining the whole data set and looking for observations of just photos of mating lizards. But the the ability to do that is that they have this sort of almost fully trained model, all of those layers that just get good visual representations of what species are, what lizards look like, that then just a little bit of data can differentiate. So we've been trying to do a little work on that on, as you're saying, a lot of these clades have hundreds of species, and maybe we only have a small fraction where we have enough species, but we probably have a pretty good sense of what that kind of group of organisms looks like. Um, yeah, and that's been one thing that we've struggled with is how much of our work should be sort of maintaining and, and operationalizing the stuff versus R&D. And we tend to sort of outsource a lot of the R&D um, groups like Visipedia and the machine learning communities. But it, the good news is there's great opportunities for collaboration. I know it's all sort of open source. There's uh, Our data is all open. And if you want to take the data and push it to the next step and come up with a really cool modeling approach, please tell us about it. And we'd love to iterate with you and maybe even deploy it and operationalizing. And I think our strength is, is mostly operationalizing these technologies that are sort of bleeding edge within the research and development communities. Yeah, no, that's that's spot on. And I and I think that's part of what this whole series is about is we have a lot of smart and very creative people that maybe operate in very different worlds than you and I live in. Um, it might see through a problem in a way that we couldn't, right? So there's there's probably people on here that that ideas are sparking through your presentation. So I've got another one here. Um, thank you, Scott, for sharing such interesting facts of citizen science contributions, particularly in the iNaturalist website. Thanks particularly for evaluating predictions with IUCN ranges. I have two questions. Do we have enough data in iNaturalist for Asian and Indian migratory birds, like say sandhill cranes? And the second question is, if we use iNaturalist website to collect data on sandhill cranes, how can we use AI for predicting the threat level in that species? So that's an interesting one around threats. Yeah, um, and in terms of the migration, um, with these models that we were sort of using, they, they're spatial temporal, right? So you're actually producing a, a distribution in time and space. At the moment, we're just scratching down across time, mainly just to have enough data and make it simpler to understand what we're doing. But, um, you know, it's fantastic to think about these species that have a real migratory or phenological sign signature to actually have that distribution changing in space and time. This uh, Visipedia group that I mentioned that we work with, Grant Van Horn, is actually at Cornell and does a lot of work with the Cornell group. I've heard you guys have heard about Merlin and Merlin Sound ID and things like that. And they're actually definitely a step ahead of us in thinking about birds and migratory species. And I definitely look at some of the work they're doing. I think this idea of estimating threats is, is fascinating. I mean, we're sort of using range size as a proxy for threat. A small range species is likely to be more threatened, but there's all sorts of opportunities and great data sets. If you think of like IUCN, you know, they have huge data set on all the different threats for these different species for 100,000 species to actually make predictions about threat. That's something I'm very interested in. We haven't done any of that, but I think that would be really interesting to see. Can you actually synthesize? I mean, I like to use the word synthesize with AI because it's not adding anything new, but can you synthesize those threats into something that really uh, brings, clarifies things that we just can't see because we have these primitive human brains and we can't see the whole picture. <laughs> That's right. And it's, you know, you're really at the, the tip of the iceberg of what can happen here. And this, as you know, you said, like during the, the course of your talk, there's probably 12,000 new, new observations and 200 people have signed up. So 
it's just growing and and the power that you can sort of mine out of that is is growing as well it's it's the you know world's your oyster um i'm just going to go to another one here um and and to everyone posting questions i'm sorry if i don't get to all of them uh but another one is data being shared by other large platforms like eBird and the smithsonian if not what would that take um data being shared to gpiv i think i think i think the question might relate to how it's interacting with iNaturalist because yeah of course like eBird and eBird observations going yeah. to gbif as well yeah and again i think you know it what's what i think is great is this different groups have different roles that all work together in this big vision so you know and, and uh andrew gonzalez talked talking about what what geobond's doing the role that nature is playing and what Jeebus doing, that's what's really great. I think our core unique asset with iNaturalist is really having this community. And to the extent that sort of by, you know, again, focusing on the community first and how to really empower and engage that community to do things like generate data and also sort of get into some of these cycles that I was talking about in the end, that we can only really do with iNaturalist community in the platform. We sort of purposely, as I mentioned, you know, putting people first, we we're only thinking about the community and the data the community is not generating. So within iNaturalist, it's just the iNaturalist data set. But I would say the jumping off point for lots of these analyses and maybe the things that you're talking about aren't at iNaturalist, they're at the GBIF level. You know, if you wanted to yeah. say, I want to make use of iNaturalist data, but I also want to make use of eBird data and everything else, you would probably start it at the GBIF level. Um, and I think that that's what's really great is that people, as long as there's sort of open data, open science infrastructure, the right protocols, we use the Darwin core uh, protocol for sharing biodiversity data. Um, you can interface with these systems at different points. So iNaturalist is the right point to interface if you really want to have that feedback with the community, which is really interesting, but certainly not the right place to interface if you wanted to bring different kinds of data sets together. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for that. That, that's, that really helps sort of put the context or positioning for iNaturalist and that sort of ecosystem of of data for biodiversity writ large. Um, so another question, is data being compared year by year to see the changes or patterns occurring? Yeah, that, I mean, not, what we're doing, and much I mentioned at the end, no, we're just collapsing across time and just squishing a year, but that's the idea. And I showed that butterfly paper that was published in Science using iNaturalist data where they actually were looking at trends across time. I mean, the problem with all this is you start subsetting the data, you know, first, taxonomically and then temporally and you know where these models are so data hungry that it gets harder and harder and we're, we're trying to push these models to find spatial scales which is again another subsetting of the data um so you very quickly become data limited but it depends on the question you want to answer but i think that that's as uh, again andy gonzalez's talk was so good at is you know we really need to get not just these indicators from this modern monitoring capacity but we have to be able to get trends which means you have to do these predictions at regular time intervals and it, it, essentially, it's totally doable. It just makes the problem even more data hungrier, data more scarce. It means we have yeah. to work harder to generate this data. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then and then one more, um, and then we we'll probably switch over to the neural network in a minute. But um, so this one's not specific to AI, but more I think around some enthusiasm. So any talks about expanding the initiative to Brazil? And I think this question might actually come from someone in Brazil. <laughs> please, please reach out and let us know. We'd love to. Um, I mean, iNaturalist is only possible because of the community and because of the great partnerships with institutions, like I mentioned, the Von Humboldt Institution. And so, um, yeah, it'd be fantastic to to work together to get get more people engaged in Brazil. And and Scott, on that, maybe I'll jump in to sort of add to that, because I've been thinking, as you were talking, I was thinking about, and, and folks might not know about what Geobon is, but you refer to it in your talk, and this is a global network for improving the quality and quantity of biodiversity observations. And Geobon works a lot at the national scale. And I'm just wondering where you do have those specific collaborations where you've got iNaturalista in Mexico and Colombia, iNaturalist Canada, um, you've had them all around the world. Do you find that that's a really great vehicle for sort of leveraging up participation? Or do you kind of get enough community participation anyways? Or is that a, is that a good model, I guess, to, to, to focus on? I mean, it's... I, I our evidence is that it is a good model and i think that like you're saying there's a lot of this is just capacity building and and the more uh like the work that nature serves doing and um uh geobond's doing you know to kind of build up this institutional capacity to kind of i think you know in many ways 
you, we're, we're, we're doing science. We're trying to answer questions and you know prevent biodiversity loss. But in many ways, what we're doing is we're trying to build up a life a, a, a lifestyle. I think about like what does soccer, yeah. the sport of soccer, do? You know, they're thinking about how do we get kids in Brazil playing soccer, and they're building up uh, tournaments and you know all sorts of infrastructure and institutionalizing that lifestyle. That's what we have to do. We have to figure out how do we get groups around the world to care about biodiversity, become naturalists. Yeah. It's, yeah institution building. And I think that Geobond's playing an incredible role in, you know, that sort of institution building activity that is a really important part of this. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about like when we work with specific nations, I wonder if we should be giving sort of an iNaturalist package or portfolio to, to sort of lower the threshold for them to adopt their own iNaturalist platform or something like that. And I think you're right. Like this is as much a social problem as it is a data problem. Um, I think about, and, and I'm totally sold on, on, on your argument that citizen science is, is really at the forefront for monitoring. So I look out my window, I, I live in Eastern Canada, and um, the vast majority of data coming uh, around biodiversity comes from iNaturalist and eBird. It's not from people that are paid to go out and collect data uh, systematically, and, and it'd be great if we had more people being able to collect systematic data. But the game largely is coming through citizen science efforts. My own naturalist community here where I live is a big user of iNaturalist and it sort of equips people on the ground and their eyes and ears. They're like human sensors, right? They're people out observing things anyways. And, and what I've seen is it doesn't just become a tool for collecting data, but it, you, you are winning the hearts and minds of, of people as they come in. Um, and then there's another one here. I think this this just came in. So this is this is a little bit about how iNaturalist kind of piggybacks off of IT infrastructure writ large. Um, you know, computers, energy consumption, all that to run these networks, to run your cell phones and all that. So is it do you have an indication on the environmental impact of iNaturalist and how does iNaturalist weigh or balance these impacts versus the outcomes and goals that you're trying to achieve? So that's an interesting question. Yeah, and I, and I actually don't have a great answer, but I, I would love to know more about that because we often think about that at training these models. It's sort of like what you would need for the, the like a Bitcoin rig, right? So it's essentially like yeah. a yeah. video card, which is a very big GPU and these sort of energy intensive servers that just spin away and train. And I often think, you know, especially with all the Bitcoin stuff, like this is very similar to Bitcoin mining. And, we, you know, we've heard a lot about the environmental impacts of that. And I think that's important. And um uh, for sure. It, I, I wish I had a better answer for that, but, you know, we have to make sure that um, the, the, the solution isn't causing its own problems for, you know, actually trying to stem biodiversity loss and think of the entire life cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Great. Okay. So we, we, we since we are 12 past the hour, we should probably uh, close it off um, and, and we'll move over to the neural network. If there's any other folks that want to reach out to you, Scott, but, uh, but again, Thank you so much. I, you were pretty much one of the first people I thought of when we started building the series. It's like, we have to have Scott talk about iNaturalist because uh, it's just, it blows me away. Totally fascinates me what you've what you've been able to do. So th thanks for your, your time today. It was really, really interesting talk. Thanks so much for having me. And, and just before we go, uh, for those that are interested in the series, the next session, the third in the series will be on March 27th. And we'll have a, a speaker from Google and Conservation International who are collaborating on a platform called Wildlife Insights, which is using AI to process camera trap uh, images from around the world. So in a way, it's a it's an interesting different angle, but a nice extension to, to some of the work you were talking about, Scott. So for those of you interested in following along, March 27th will be the next one. So thanks again, and thanks very much, Scott. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool.
summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.
Thank mm-hmm. you.